Hello, Oaks Christian. How you doing? Is anybody a CSI fan out there? All right, ready? CSI? CSI Miami? CSI New York? CSI Cyber? Who done it? Yes, I'm Anthony E. Zyker. I am the creator of the biggest franchise in the world, CSI. Thank you. I started out just like you, just like you, dreaming big as a young person. I was like, how do I address these guys? Good morning, I'm gonna say good morning. Future is who you are. So, welcome. Now, how does a guy from Las Vegas, an only child, grow up to do 16 years of television, 804 episodes, four series, over the span of 804 shows, 16 years, at $12 billion in revenue. It's being watched every second of every day, setting two world records, and watched by 73.8 million people, not to mention in every country but six. North Korea doesn't watch it. Uzbekistan doesn't watch it. And here I am, this only child dreaming big, always wanting to be something, wanting to do something, wanting to change the world. And I really didn't have anything. Didn't have any money. I was a latchkey kid. Grew up in Las Vegas. I was in Chicago for 18 months. Mom moved me west. But when I walked around St. Anne's, that Catholic school, I used to daydream and I'd get in trouble. They'd write me pink slips, want to kick me out of school. Probably undiagnosed ADHD. Probably on the spectrum of Asperger's. Who knows? But I wasn't daydreaming, teachers. I was dreaming. I was dreaming to be somebody. And I was a nobody. But nothing. So in the world, I'm innocent. There's a science fair at St. Anne's. St. Biter said no to my mother because she was a cocktail waitress, and that's considered a sin in the 70s, but St. Anne's took me on. It was Science Project Day. I had no money. I got a box at the back of the Albertson store. I stole a can of blue spray paint. I borrowed some plaster of Paris. I made this glacier. Had some strings with some beautiful snowflakes on it. Wrote a beautiful paper in cursive. I know that's strange. Cursive. And I handed it in. I was in fifth grade, no money, begged, borrowed, and stealed to participate. During recess, I snuck to the bathroom to look through the window to see who had won best of show. And guess who, who won? No. It was on my project, best of show, purple ribbon this big. But then the nuns kind of got together and went, holding class clown sinner and took the ribbon off my project and put it on somebody else's. Nuns. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm in Catholic school. Like, how are, we, how are we rolling like that? It was the first time that my innocence shattered. It was the first time an adult did me dirty like that, but inspired me to show them Next month, there was a creative, writing, a creative writing assignment. I wrote a paper called The Rocky Road. I did my research. It was about a little boy that went up a rocky road, a mountain of ice cream. And I wrote in cursive every letter, rewrite, redraft. And I handed that paper in. And I got the biggest A with a big fat red marker. And that was the moment I said, I'm going to be a writer and I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to pick up a pen and start writing Hamiltonian style. And that's what I did. I went on, and I went, I'm telling you, I was the biggest hustler. I sold candy at school. I sold donuts. I went door to door. Knock, knock, knock. Hi, I'm from the Blank Blank Society. You want to buy some candy? I was so broke, but I was always hustling. When I got into high school, I joined a thing called college uh, uh, forensic speech, where you compete in speech, kind of like football and basketball. And I was terrible. But one time I got into the final, I took second place, I got my trophy, and realized I can do it. 
I was dreaming big. I was learning how to write and speak and edit and pitch and all these things I was doing in school that I didn't know how to master plan. I was getting ready for the world, getting ready for Hollywood. When I got into college, I used to write people's papers for them. 300 bucks, guarantee you a B plus overnight. I gotta tell you, during the heights of UNLV basketball where we crushed Duke by 31 the championships, I had so much money because people wanted to go watch the game. But this guy likes to write, and this guy likes to make money. So I went ahead and had so much business. So when they gave me the Hall of Fame award at UNLV, I said, hey, before you give me this award, just know that I kind of illegally put kids through college. Just have a role like that. But I was a writer. I was drawing from inspiration. And one day, uh, my estranged father came by, his name is Eddie, and said, what are you working on, son? I'm like, I'm working on a speech called about Dungeons and Dragons. I know I haven't talked to you in five years. Why are you bothering me? And he said, well, I'll, I'll come by and I'll help you with your speech. I'll make some manwich and we'll hang out together. I'm like, oh, really? Great, Dad. I haven't seen in five years who never participated in my life. So I got excited and I got my speech together and guess what happened? Never showed. Never showed up. That was the second time they broke my innocence. Now I gotta prove you wrong. So I blazed through college, all full ride scholarships, finished in three years, every summer school. I would have no college life. I would have full ride scholarships all over the country. I was going to prove them wrong. And when I got my two college degrees and my master's, I couldn't get a job. I drove a tram for $8 an hour at the Mirage Hotel, to the Mirage Hotel, to Treasure Island, to the Mirage Hotel, to Treasure Island, $8 an hour, nine o'clock at night, till five in the morning. But I am not the average tram driver. I'm Anthony E. Zyker. And what does that mean? I'll talk to customers. How you doing, where are you from? China. How do you say my name is Anthony in Chinese? What do mean zhu, jiao, Anthony, perfect. I spoke 25 languages by talking with people on the tram, and I made this thing called the International Phonetic Language Booklet, because there's no better way to respect a customer than to speak their language. And I put this thing together. Next thing you know, Steve Wynn wants a copy, his mom Zoma Wynn wants a copy, the people at the front desk want a copy. The problem with speaking 25 languages, I only said, spoke to say five things. Welcome to Mirage, my name is Anthony, the volcano's every five minutes, thank you and goodbye. So when the Cambodian people come up and say, ah, Chumarib Sul, I'd be like, oh, Chumarib Sul, and they go, G -g 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 and I can't speak Cambodian. But <laughs> I went from tram host to bellman to a baggage handler, and I realized that that was kind of a trap. Like me making tips in the casinos was gonna be a trap. I got away from writing. So, one day, I bought a book called How to Write a Screenplay by Sid Field. And I read that book, and I wrote my first movie called The Runner. It was about a gambler in Vegas. I sold that script to some guy out here for $30,000. And he sold that script the next day for 1.2 million. Deal or no deal, here's your penny, Anthony. Uh, thank God that fell through. We shot the movie. It went to Blockbuster, guaranteed her it's free. And believe me, it was free, because it wasn't very good. But it got me in the business. And my first job in Hollywood was called The Harlem Globetrotter Story. Or they offered me, remember that movie, I Know What You Did Last Summer? That horror movie? They offered me the sequel. It was called I Still Know What You Did Last Summer. So either take the horror movie, guaranteed in the theater, two tickets for the premiere, I had just got in town, I'm 29 years old, or be the second writer in a small Globetrotter sports movie. By a show of hands, who would take the guaranteed theater job in Hollywood? Raise your hand. Raise them up. Okay. Who would take the sports movie, small movie, not guaranteed to get green lit? You're all fired. I took the sports movie. Why? 
My manager said, if you do that, that horror movie, you'll be a cheesy horror writer in this town and you'll be out of the business in two years. So I listened. I wrote the Globetrotter movie for 18 months. They paid me $125,000. I'm like, yeah, I'm rich. Never got made. But it was on the desk of Jerry Bruckheimer at a time where he wanted to do television. He called me in. He said, what do you want to do for TV? I'm like, I, I don't know. I think maybe something in the forensic world. So I watched this show called New Discoveries. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, New Detective on Discovery Channel. And in that sort of documentary, there's, in the summer of 2004, there was this infraction with crime. I watched that, got inspired, did a drive along with the Metropolitan Police Department, all my research, and wrote that script at 28 years old. My first TV script. I go into ABC and pitch it. They say no. It's what called they passed. So I got mad, it's okay. If you pass on me, I'm going to do a company called Dare to Pass. Dare to Pass on me. I went to CBS. Pitched my heart out. The young lady said, I just bought Survivor, and I'm going to buy this. You write me a great script, Anthony, I'll put it on the air. So I wrote that script in four days. We shot that script for nine million bucks. It aired October 16th of 2000 to 24 million viewers. It was the number seventh highest rating in the country that week. I was barely 30. We went on a year later to go, my boss called me in, pick a city, Miami, CSI Miami. A year later, two years later, pick a city, CSI New York. Together, Carol Mendelson, Ann Donahue, Jerry Bruckheimer, Jonathan Littman, Les Moonves, together, we built the most successful franchise in television history. And why was that? Not for fame, not for fortune, to try to get my father's attention. And when he took his life in 2006, I flew back to Las Vegas, walked through his apartment, and tore the whole place apart, looking for something that says, I remember you, son. I love you, son. And there was nothing there. Not a CSI article, nothing. I have nothing but questions. I have zero answers. And even in death, which is now over 10 years, I'm still working 18 hour days. And I'm still creating TV shows. And I'm still writing Broadway for, on Soul Train on Broadway. And I'm still raising three boys, trying to convince them that their father loves them because mine's been taken away. So you talk about drawing inspiration, not just to pay nuns back, not just to pay dad back, but I'm chasing a dragon that I'm never gonna catch. My heart is this big, my mind is this big, my drive is this big, and if anything I've said today can rub off on you about drawing inspiration from something that's tragic or from love, when I had nothing, I don't have rich parents. I'm an only child from Vegas, working his way up from nothing. But I dream big, and I'm talented, and I outwork people, and I respect people, and I shake people's hands, and I give my time, and I give my effort, and I give my heart, and I give my soul. When I make eggs for my kids, and I break a yolk, I eat it. I give them the eggs that look like Denny's menu. If I burn sausage, I eat it, or the dog. <laughs> because I take pride when I make breakfast for my kids, and I take pride when I write award-winning speeches, or television shows, or win Emmys. My name is Anthony E. Zeichert. I'm the creator of the biggest TV show in the world. Thank you, and God bless.